What brain training programs actually focus on is what we call cognitive functions. It's these functions that make up our intelligence, our intellect, our thinking. Functions such as our ability to maintain attention and inhibit it at different times, our flexibility in the use of knowledge, also our memory, our working memory. Can we retain information for short periods, combine it and work with it? Brain training focuses on those functions and what we do know it does a very good job of improving those specific functions. Just recently, for example, there was a study published in Nature where they looked at people engaged in an experimental task that really tested the skills related to multitasking, and that's your ability to switch attention. So I might be, for example, boiling an egg while listening to All in the Mind and trying to recall what I'm hearing on All in the Mind, but I, I want my three-minute egg, and so I'm moving between those two tasks. And, and that's what this tested. And what you discovered is as you go from 20-year-olds through to 70-year-olds, the performance on that multitasking goes down. But through a training program over four weeks of one hour a day, for people from 60 to 85, they boosted their performance to the same level as a 20-year-old. The performance improvement was shown to be related to EEG measures of theta coefficients, at which around the brain area that is related to multitasking activity. So a study like that leads us to think, boy, there's so much we can do. What we do know from the research is brain training can definitely improve your performance on the cognitive functions. What we don't know with confidence yet is does that translate into reprogramming of your brain and then does it translate into sort of this ec ecology or everyday behaviour? And these are among the questions that the collaboration between uh, the Flory Neuroscience Institute and uh, the ABC is going to... We're going to try and fill in the gaps in that research and extend it out to everyday behaviour and back into the brain functions. Five. You saw one. What was the other? Well, didn't see it. Didn't see it. OK. So. That means it was in the window of your blank. How important is attention in whether we remember or not? Attention is extremely important because encoding stage is where actually it fails a lot. So people who struggle to say, oh, I forgot where I put my keys or I forgot where I've done that and this and, you know, start to worry about early onset dementia, um, those forgettings um, really are due to failure to encode and you know if you don't attend to something then you can't actually encode that so attention is extremely important and you know not only paying attention and concentrating on something but actually being flexible so that you can switch it to more important things that's really important in memory formation and then hence you'll remember better <laughs> Does attention diminish with age as well? That's definitely the case. And it actually is one of the first things to diminish. So before you even notice that you don't remember things, your attention is probably drifting. <laughs> attention relies on this brain region called the frontal lobe and especially frontal temporal cortex. And somehow it seemed to be really affected the actual um, wiring of that region with white matter seemed to be really affected by about 45 years of age and it starts to decline. And are there any particular things that, that we can do to perhaps slow that reduction of, of attention? White meta, so the wiring of the brain, seem to be affected by lots of things. So stress is definitely one. Alcohol and um, drugs of abuse, um, things like inhalants and toluene, um, just bad chemicals like pain fume, those things can affect those regions. And I guess it may be the case that declining um, of function in that region is inevitable, but maybe you can really delay or defer that process for a long time if you learn to protect or if you can manage to protect um, the white matter of that brain region. What happens in the brain when we practice, we go over something over and over? What happens actually in the brain to help us remember things? When you practice and rehearse the frontal cortex and the places like the hippocampus are actually um, using up lots of glucose 
as evidenced by imaging. So there are specific brain regions that are actively engaged in that rehearsal and practicing um, processes because those regions are also related to storage of memories and consolidation of memories. It could be strengthening those connections and chemical processes to make memory really, really strong. What are the most important characteristics to build into a brain training program for it to be most effective? It's really important that what, whichever training cognitive task is fairly difficult but achievable. So you don't want to put the um, organism in a situation where it's just unachievable and they get really stressed out and they develop something called learned helplessness. So it needs to be difficult enough, but not too difficult that it's impossible. And it has to be quite complicated. So it can't be like a single training with a single movement, but it could be using a variety of stimuli, visual, tactile, um, you know, auditory. It's very important to have attention flexibility tasks that really facilitates switching of attention to, you know, prioritise more important information versus less important information. And also inhibitory training, so learning to inhibit impulsive responses might also be important as well. One of the big problems with brain training is many people who sign up don't ever play it or they only play it once or twice. And the reasons for that uh, are many, but among the major reasons is boredom. It, they're not really interesting sometimes. Uh, secondly, frustration. People don't like failing. And third, uh, just a fear of failure. So some people, rather than seeing it as a training opportunity, might view it as a test, and so they, they don't want to undertake it. So we've developed an algorithm that underpins it, and it's almost like a classroom of one, where when you're playing it, it's constantly monitoring your performance on different types of tasks, and it's allocating tasks to you, so you have a sense of progressive mastery. You don't get caught in a downward spiral of failure. People will keep doing things, that one, that they feel challenged, and two, they, they believe they've got a chance of succeeding. So if tasks are too difficult or you can't see yourself making progress, then you give up. So if you've got a classroom of students that are at different stages of, say, mathematics or any particular topic, you know, for some people this will be dead easy and boring. For others it will be frustrating, I can't do this. And for some it will be challenging and achievable. And so one of the benefits of this algorithm we've built into active memory is it adapts that for individuals so that we try and maintain this sense of challenge and achievement. And people use the term self-efficacy to label that, this sense of, I believe I can do this, I'm going to be challenged but I can do it. If you play these games, they may not change your cognitive function. Let's assume they didn't, they know differently. Brain. But if they boosted your confidence, then that means when people are confident and they feel a sense of mastery, they use their knowledge and the resources they have much more effectively. You know, they don't fall at the first mistake, they recover, they think about it. And, like, and there's a fantastic uh, body of work and a website by Carol Dweck at Stanford, a, a former colleague, and we've done some research in this area. And she characterises people as having two mindsets, either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. People with a fixed mindset tend to believe natural talents, personality, you know, abilities are all fixed things, that you're either good at something or you're not. Uh, whereas a growth mindset tends to see performance on any particular task, be it music or mathematics, as a product of learning and development and the strategies that you put in. Now, kids and adults with a fixed mindset, when they fail, they take it as evidence of a lack of ability and they, they get anxious and then that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you're anxious, you're not, you're not confident, you're not using your knowledge, you start to withdraw and then suddenly you hear young kids saying, oh, I'm just no good at maths and they're withdrawing, right? Whereas a person with a growth mindset is more likely to say, well, what, what didn't I understand? What can I do to improve this? And it, these fixed versus growth mindsets can be fostered through parenting. You know, if you're constantly saying to kids, oh, you're a natural, or you're fantastic, or you don't have a brain for maths, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Environmental enrichment is very important. And it can't just be one thing, and it's not going to be a quick fix either. It's a prolonged thing and your daily interactions, what you choose to do, where you choose to be, um, how you choose to interact and the activities you get involved in. You have to be very active about those things um, to have the best crack at preserving what you already have.
we're not gonna, you know, make our brains larger and become these amazing, intelligent people by actually living that way. But at least we won't decline. I think that's a very important thought. Like, you need to stop yourself from becoming worse and worse and worse. And that is going to be an active process. Like when you're, you know, standing in a wave, you have to fight against a wave to stay still. And I think that's something we really need to remember. <laughs>